You've been lied to, but you don't know how. You've searched, you've struggled, you've cried out. You want the truth, but where is it? You've wandered, you've fought, you've strived, and you have not been satisfied. What is truth? Where is truth? Who is truth? The kingdom of God, mind control, the last days, higher dimensions, unity, the power of faith, discovering the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. God has promised that he will hide us under his feathers and under his wings we will trust. His truth shall be our shield and our buckler. Discovering the Truth with Dan DeVall is the premier program that is designed to center you on the kingdom of God, to equip you with faith in Jesus Christ, and to unveil the truth behind the lies. This program is designed to show you how to become more than you have ever imagined through the power of truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And now, prepare for your host, Dan Duvall. You're listening to Discovering the Truth with Dan Duvall. This show is designed to center you on the kingdom of God, to equip you with faith in Jesus Christ, and to unveil the truth behind the lies. This program is a production of Bride Ministries, and you can find us at www.bridemovement.com. We have a really exciting topic today. We're going to be talking about the dimensions of time, the dimensions of space, and cherubim chariots with Josh Peck. Look forward to that. Before we get there, I'm going to be giving you guys a brief update as to what's been going on. I've been telling you for a while now that my wife and I, we're relocating, and we are. Life is exciting. God's doing something. You know, he's moving a lot of things around. He's moving people around. We're part of that. And um, while I don't completely understand everything the Lord is doing, what I do know is that I'm managing the situation and circumstance to the best of my ability. What this means is that there are certain things I've had to put on hold, inclusive of our discipleship agenda. Folks, Bride Ministries has an agenda to disciple people so that they better reflect and mirror the things that Jesus Christ has designed them to express, the person he's designed them to be. We want to make disciples of Jesus Christ. And we have a four-phase series to do that. It's called Grace in Christ, the Kingdom of God, and then finally Spiritual Warfare. And I have a lot of people on my waiting list. I have the existing groups that are just biting at the bit. Like, when are you going to get started, Dan? And you know what? I plan to get started as soon as I can. Once I know I'm not going to have my evenings consumed by personal business and I'm settling or ready to get settled, we're going to launch. And uh, look forward to that. There are a lot of people on my waiting list now. Folks, I'm going to be honest. We have a lot of people on the waiting list waiting to start more than we can start with. Uh I am trying to figure out ways to expand to allow for the number of people that want to participate to actually participate and not leave you on a waiting list for like till next year. I mean, uh, we but we are l- trying to figure out how, how to grow this. And um, I'm already looking at, you know, who has already gone through the groups that can lead groups themselves and different things. We, we I mean, the plan from the beginning is to replicate the process. So, you know, I won't necessarily have to lead every group, nor, nor do I want to. Um, but. The studies themselves are so empowering, I I really believe in the material, which is all based on the Word of God. So, you know, we are looking to see what we can do with this on this front, and uh, we will be relaunching discipleship as soon as we can. If you haven't gotten your hands on Kingdom Government and the Promise of Sheep Nations, the book is available, it's selling, Uh, people (laughs) getting their hands on it and being uh, challenged, the book is intense. Over 400 pages, at least in the the PDF form, if if you get it on on uh, 
Amazon or Barnes and Noble in an ebook format. It, it comes out to more like 350 pages. Uh, it is an, a, a revelation, revolution and a revelation packed into a data file. And it's not expensive, folks. I've priced it way below what I think it's worth. I, I mean, the book itself, the amount of research material in there, I mean, it's worth way more, but I'm selling it for way less because I just simply want to get it into your hands. I want people to get their hands on this book, to read it, to consider the things that are in there, touching on eschatology, the kingdom, God's plan for the church, things coming on the earth. I mean, it is very deep and a lot of subject, a lot of grounds covered and addressed. Also, look forward to our, my upcoming book, Higher Dimensions, Parallel Dimensions, and the Spirit Realm. I do plan to release that later this year. If you've been following us for a while, you'll know that I, I was talking about media for a while, breaking into media, doing different things with media. We were really excited about it. I told you we have a script for a television program pilot, and we do. <laughs> you know what else we have? We actually have a business plan to build a media studio. It's written. It's done. <laughs> I have it. Uh, we are fully committed to this agenda, but it's also been somewhat postponed with the relocation and everything else that's going on. A lot of pieces are moving around. God's authoring it. So, you know, we're taking our time, everything in the right time. It's not going anywhere, but, you know, it is uh, being postponed at least as far as my original timeline was concerned. I actually had planned to begin filming by about this time. But um, it's not going anywhere. Things are going to happen. We have a whole list of projects that are pegged to be created, scripting to be done. I mean, uh, it's really exciting. So uh, there will be more coming from us on the agenda for media. I also have an agenda, and this one isn't going anywhere, to underwrite the costs of helping individuals that have suffered from dissociative identity disorder because of mind control agendas. This is so exciting. We're helping five people right now. We have people on our waiting list and we are trying to help more. I want to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on helping people that have dissociative identity disorder. But in order to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know what I need? <laughs> I need hundreds of thousands of dollars. I actually need that capital. Um, the other thing I need are the people, the coaches themselves, people that are able to do this work. Right now, we do have a small team. We're trying to expand the number of people that are working with us that are able to help people that have dissociative identity disorder. In the future, we plan to actually build a facility to help people that cannot cannot heal in their current circumstances because their living situation is so challenged. And in the future, we want to reproduce facilities around the world. You, you know what else, folks? I, I'm going to be honest. Last week, I had the privilege of going on a, a couple of radio programs, but uh, one in particular, Hagman and Hagman, I, I was invited on and they gave me the platform to talk about a subject. I just called it dimensions of mind control. And the amount of response I have gotten from that program has been overwhelming. I, I've literally been over here drowning in emails. It's been so many come in because of what I was talking about. So many people are having dots connected at this point in time. And you know what? There is a flood coming of people that are being awakened to the fact that they need help. And you know who's not helping them? Um, well... <laughs> Churches, <laughs> established churches. It's, it's a common practice for many churches to turn over people that really need help the most to quote unquote specialists, secular psychologists, things like that. And what we're finding is, you know, no amount of secular psychology can help a person that has been programmed, demonized, satanically, ritually abused. And that is the mission field that we are trying to engage. So uh, we need to grow to the extent that we are able to help the amount of people that are looking to be helped. And I believe that everything in God's kingdom is already provided for. So we're just trying to put all the pieces together. We're trying to get the coaches on our team. We're trying to get the finances together to cover the costs of people that are needing help. And we're trying to wake up the people that need help so that they know they need it. And 
you know what? I want to thank those of you that are in the listening audience who do pray for me because I know you're out there and I know you're praying for me. And I, I am so appreciative of it because I need it. <laughs> I need it. I, I realize at this point I am walking around with a giant target on my back. I am finding myself going into the depths of darkness and um, basically planting TNT down there and blowing stuff up <laughs> very literally in the spirit realm. Uh, this is exactly what we're doing sometimes. And so it, the the thing is like, yeah, I, I, I realized that, you know, man, your prayers are really, really making a difference. And I want to thank those of you that have committed to that. Those of you that have jumped on board to financially support us. We want to do so much, but everything we want to do costs money. Thank you for sowing into us. I, I must have one of the most generous listening audiences because you guys have like been stepping up in a big way. And I am just always impressed by the generosity of those of you that are listening to this program, buying into our vision, helping to support it as in order to come this far, <clears throat> we've needed people to step up to the plate, to sow into what we're doing. And you have, and you have, and I am just believing God that as we're, called to grow, called to expand, called to reach more people. Um, God is simply going to be linking you up with me, those of you that are listening to this program, people that have a heart for the things we're talking about to support us financially so we can, you know, I mean, just run, <laughs> run the race which has been set before us. Praise the Lord. So that's what's going on there. You know, we're helping five. We, we want to help thousands. Man, folks, we are really going somewhere. You know where else we're going? I've been talking about an internet-based church service. We're going to do this. We are so going to do this. And uh, it is going to be a house church model approach to ministry. We are going to have live worship experience, or if it's not, it's going to be pre-recorded. We're going to play it. We're going to produce it well. We're going to have teaching done by not only myself, but my friends as well. Um, that's really going to engage you. We're going to be after the meat. We're going to be after the real uh crux of what's going on in the world right now. We're going to be after empowering and equipping believers um, to prepare the body and as a bride for Jesus Christ. Uh, we're going after all of these things. Um, again, we have to build it. It's going to cost some money. There's going to be uh, also a need for people. And, you know, I am Folks, are just amazed. There are those of you that listen to this program that are writing me saying, Daniel, this is how I think I can help. Daniel, this is what I'm good at. Daniel, this, ah, praise the Lord for you. I have a document on my computer where I'm like putting names and, uh, uh, you know, descriptions of what I am being told people are able to do. We're, we're trying to put it together, folks. And it's really exciting to see how God is just uh, doing this and putting it all together and involving me in the process. I, I, when I, when I work with people, I tell them, you know, he, he's the God, he is the, the, the coach, he is the counselor. I'm the assistant. And, and that's really how I view ministry. I, I see Jesus doing it. I'm his assistant. And so I'm working with him <laughs> to try to pull all this together. And uh, you know, uh, God keeps his assistants pretty busy. So Anyway, we are going after it. And of course, as I've been talking about, the revolutionary part of what we want to do is to integrate Google Hangouts type technology so that those that listen to the live service are able to engage with other believers around the world in meaningful, deep dialogue through moderated groups via Internet technology. How cool is that? Um, not only that, but they're also able to uh, engage maybe a house church group with others on the internet. I, I, I hope that people, when we finally launch this, have you know friends and family get together in their home to be a part of this experience. It's, it's just so, so, so awesome. And you know, one of the things people get on their high horse about internet ministry is not real ministry, you know? And, um, well, I happen to disagree. One of the major things people will point out is, well, how can you ever have impartation, Daniel? You can't have the laying on of hands. You can't have true impartation with Internet ministry. You know, this is just a child's game. Really? Well, you know, then tell that to the people that have received the gifts of the Spirit in our discipleship courses. <laughs> like we have seen that happen on Google Hangouts already. There is no distance in the spirit. And, you know, I believe that this is a mission field that God has just called us to. You know, he didn't drop me 
in the church building. I I tried to put myself in there and I couldn't, I couldn't, <laughs> I could not get in there. But you know where God has planted me is, is right here where I am, reaching those of you that listen to this program, other radio shows, those that reach out to me that I'm coaching, working with personally one-on-one. I mean, that is what God has called me. So I'm just, yeah, I'm, I'm just being faithful to that. Praise the Lord. So, you know, folks, at the end of the day, um, one of the last things I want to point out is, yes, I do want to interface what we're doing in Bride Ministries with real business, profit, capital. I don't want to be sitting up here asking for money and support. That That is extremely unappealing to me. What I want to do is underwrite everything with business, which means I want corporate sponsorship. I want to link arms with people that want to do real business. And I want to get into business as well. Real estate, um, overseas ventures, other things. I mean, I have so many things cooking in my brain. Uh, I really need an administrative assistant, uh, <laughs> which is probably going to come sooner than later. I'm going to be honest. I, I'm going to have to hire somebody to help me out. Um, but, you know, we're working on all of these pieces. We have a bunch of pieces in front of us. We're putting all the pieces together. We're excited to bring you along with us. And, um, man, what else I'm excited about is dimensions of time, dimensions of space, and cherubim chariots. So don't go anywhere. We'll be back with Josh Peck in just a minute. back on discovering the truth with Dan Duvall now sitting with our guest Josh Peck and he's been a guest with us once before to talk about a book he wrote called Quantum Creation. He is a Christian author and biblical researcher and is also the founder of Mini Study Ministry whose goal is to provide short personal and inexpensive study materials. He also has a weekly internet radio program called The Sharpening and you can check him out at www dot mini study ministry dot com. Now this week we're having him back on to focus on his most recent book titled Cherubim Chariots, which uh is really cool, especially because he put my name <laughs> in the beginning of the book. So I was like, wow, that's so cool, Josh. Thank you for the shout out. Um and so we're gonna get into this and how it relates to some of the more I guess, unapproached subjects of the Bible. You know, you get into a lot of things that people, they, they don't really pay attention to, Josh, in the in the Bible. They kind of read over a lot of the passages that you dive right into in that book. So I'm excited about it. Welcome back to Discovering the Truth with Dan Duvall. Well, thank you for having me back on. It's always a pleasure and a blessing to talk with you. And I, I'm really excited about this uh, this talk and and you're absolutely right. There there are a lot of uh, a lot of passages in the Bible that they're easy to gloss over, or the you know the the church as a whole will will teach that uh, some things are more important than other things. And well, I I say we should look at the you know look at what other people are saying are unimportant because a lot of times that's where the true importance is. You know, at least in my research. So uh, I, I I'm really happy to you know, come back on your show and, 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 uh, talk about this. Awesome. Well, Hey, let's, let's get into it. I mean, first of all, talk to us about cherubim chariots, the title of the book. Why'd you call it that? 
Well, I really wanted to look into what's known as the extra dimensional hypothesis, but from a biblical uh, viewpoint, because I, I think that that's the most accurate way to, to approach things like this. Um, and and the, the subtitle of the book is Exploring the Extra Dimensional Hypothesis. And, and really where that came from was uh, chapter five of my book, Quantum Creation, talked about um, how the entertainment industry is really pushing this alien agenda and, and, and uh, you know, ancient astronauts and uh, um, ancient aliens, that show, stuff like that. It's really, really pushing this this theology so um well in the in the ufo community there there's really two ways to look at the ufo phenomenon you know what what these things are and what's causing them and um the two main ways are uh, the, the first is the extraterrestrial hypothesis which says that uh ufos and their pilots um are from another planet it's it's another species on another planet that are that are visiting us and the other the other view which isn't as not, it's not nearly as popular though i believe that it should be uh is called the extra dimensional hypothesis which says that the ufos and their pilots are from uh, a higher dimension and I, I think the reason that that isn't quite as popular is because there's a lot of misunderstanding you know when it comes to what a higher dimension is. And, you know, we talked a lot about that in your, uh, in the, the first time that I was on, but I, I think that's, that's where a lot of the confusion comes from the, on the surface, it would seem the extraterrestrial hypothesis would be the easiest to accept. And of course, this is from the viewpoint of somebody who has, you know, no real foundation in God or the Bible or, you know, biblical truth or anything like that. So if they're just going into it fresh and they're seeing this stuff, of course, the easiest explanation on the surface is that they're from another planet. But there are a lot of an anomalous things that can't really be um, explained very well from the, the ETH, which is extraterrestrial hypothesis. Uh the biggest one is how do they get here? I mean, from so far away, but you know, of course mm -hmm. there's ways around that. People will say, well, they're traveling through wormholes or, or things like that. Um, but when you actually look at the science of what, what it would take to create something like that, I mean, the, 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 the civilization that can harness that kind of energy for one thing, I don't think would have any interest of doing any, anything with our planet, but even if so, I mean, it would take, near godlike uh <laughs> amounts of, of of energy and intelligence to be able to do something like that it, it's it, it it gets to the point where it's just ridiculous and you gotta you gotta break the laws of physics to be able to do it yet if it's extra if it's extra dimensional if it's from a higher dimension they really don't need uh they don't really need much higher technology to get here if 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 their nature is of a higher dimension they just if they want to be here, they can just be here. Um, I, I, I talked about the Flatland example the first time I was on. Sure. Uh, you know, imagine imagine a two dimensional universe. How would we get into a two dimensional universe? We just stick our finger in, and there you go. No technology needed. Mm -hmm. um, so that you know, there and there are a lot of things that we'll probably talk about throughout the course of this episode that that uh, you know explains why the extra dimensional hypothesis makes a lot, lot more sense but the the real reason you know going back to your question i kind of went off on a tangent there but the title uh cherubim chariots really came from the idea that these things were talked about in ancient texts mm -hmm. you know this isn't this isn't just a modern phenomenon um it it is a modern phenomenon and i think i think that it's happening more now than it ever has before but um well yeah i mean May, 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 maybe around the time, uh, you know, before the flood or, or in the days of Nimrod, maybe it was more, or maybe we're getting to that point. But generally, it, it's happening, you know, more now. Um, okay. But when we look at the when we look at ancient texts like the 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 Bible, it talks about how these beings, these spiritual beings, had chariots. Uh, ancient Indian texts called them vamanas, and you know, the Bible the Bible just says they're chariots, you know, and um, and uh, and the cherubim are a class of angel in in the Bible that uh, that pilots these things. So that that's a very long way of answering your question of where the title came from. <laughs> <laughs> right. So we're we're it's just to summarize, we're looking at the difference between what's called the extraterrestrial hypo 
hypothesis and the extra dimensional hypothesis to explain visits from strangers. And we're talking about, I assume, greys, reptilians, Nordics, things like this that people are reporting and not having context for. Uh, Absolutely. And in order to do that, you, you are taking the side of extra dimensional hypothesis, which I think is more accurate uh, as well. And y you're basically relating that to the fact that the Bible does talk about angels having chariots and other people have alluded to these vehicles that supernatural entities have like Vimanas, which we'll talk about more in a, in a little bit. And, and so you're drawing some tangents between these concepts, yes? Yeah, absolutely. And when we look at the when we look at the term extra dimensional and the term spiritual, mm -hmm. uh, when we when we just look at those two terms and really what they mean, they're synonymous. They they basically mean the same thing. When physicists today and uh, you know scientists talk about extra dimensions or or um, or possible extra dimensional entities. Whether they realize it or not, they're talking about spiritual entity. It's the same thing. Uh, you know, a lot of times in our culture, we think of the spirit world or, you know, heaven or angels as like these wispy, ethereal things that aren't really made of anything. But the the truth is they're they're more solid than we are. We're we're the ethereal thing. You know, we're we're the things that's that that's not really made of substance, you know, um, we're, we're like the shadow of, uh, of a higher existence. And the Bible talks all about that. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's really clear. So, well, um, uh, science, science is just now catching up to that idea. <laughs> exactly. And I, you know, I have a lot of thoughts on this issue and I'm not going to get into all of them, but you know, what I've come to understand, Josh, is that a lot of these entities want physicality because that is the anchor to this planet in this dimension where all the action's happening but even humans that we have our body we're born into this world so we have a right to be here you know we have a spirit man that is extra dimensional that was designed to be yeah. with god and is an eternal substance and you know uh, a lot of times christians we get our eyes off of the eternal nature of what god created us to be and really do lower our view to, you know, the flesh, the carnal material. We just get stuck there when God's, you know, he's trying to motivate. The Bible says he's written eternity upon the hearts of men. That that speaks volumes. But here, here's what I want to get into now, because you've really set up a nice, a, a nice foundation. Uh, <laughs> talking about some interesting things. What does this have to do with the Garden of Eden? Oh, man, that's where it all starts. <laughs> Um, th this was uh, this was a really interesting area of study for me because when I was um, before I started writing and when I was really uh, getting into this fringe Christian thing, you know, three years ago or so, um, I remember I, I was really and still am. I, I was really into the, the research of uh, of Chuck Missler. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember he he had a he had a presentation on YouTube um, where he was talking about the Garden of Eden. He uh, put forth the idea that uh, before the fall, perhaps uh, Adam and Eve were uh, extra dimensional in nature, that they had access to all dimensions. And I, I thought that that was absolutely fascinating. So I, I, I wanted to look into that myself, but, uh, you know, I wanted to wait for the right book to do it. So <laughs> I, I did it with this one. So I, I waited a couple of years, but, um, but yeah, he, he was I believe he was absolutely right and I think that there's a lot of evidence for it but it's it's in the Hebrew and this this is why it's so important to be able to you know go back to uh, the original languages um, so let me look at my notes here uh, and, and this this actually has to do with the cherubim too and, and what what uh, what their whole deal is so the first real mention that we have of the cherubim in, in the Bible is the book of Genesis. And uh, after Adam and Eve rebelled, God expelled them from the garden. And uh, after that, God placed cherubim in the garden to protect the tree of life. It, it says in Genesis 3, 24, so he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So what's interesting there is uh, that word east where it says he placed at east at the east of the garden. You know, we would we would just think of that as just a direction, and in most cases it is. But it it has a in the Hebrew, 
and I'm not a Hebrew scholar, so I'm probably going to butcher this pronunciation, uh, Kedem, uh, it has a, a double meaning. So most times, like I said, it just means east, the, like the, the compass direction. But uh, it can also mean uh, things like ancient or aforetime, earliest time, the beginning, and, and uh, among others. So that word, uh, Kedem, is used to describe an attribute of God in, in other places, uh, such as Deuteronomy 33:27, which says, The eternal God is thy refuge. And in that verse, the word eternal was translated from that same Hebrew word kadem, which, you know, is translated to east in, in, earlier in Genesis. So that, that shows the timeless attribute of God. And describing God as eternal conveys the idea that he's outside of time you know, itself. He doesn't have a beginning or an, an end. So that could help explain an aspect of creation that's not normally considered. Um, earlier in the book of Genesis, Genesis 2.8, it says the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. So that word planted comes from the Hebrew word nada, and also, and, and that means uh, established. Now, since the word eastward comes from Kedem, that, that could be conveying the idea that the garden itself was originally established in a place outside of time as we know it. And, uh, uh, you know, the fact that the garden had, you know, it had a beginning, so it disqualifies it from being truly eternal in, this, in the way that God is. You know, God's the only thing that's that's actually, you know, eternal, no beginning or end. But mm -hmm. it could be showing that it originated from a state that's outside of the normal flow of time and, and spatial uh, dimensions. Um, so that, that, that could be an attempt to describe a place of a different space time than, you know, we're familiar with. Uh, now that, that might, that, that goes into why Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden. And um, so keeping in mind, Chuck Missler's idea that that before Adam and Eve fell, they had access to all dimensions of space and time. Um, well, at the time of the rebellion, there seems to have been like a split in the dimensions because we don't have access to anything higher than the third spatial and the first temporal. I don't know if there are more dimensions of time or not, but uh, that that that's a whole other tangent. Uh, but um, I, I've actually wondered the same thing. But yeah, if, I, the the really interesting thing about that, Josh, uh -huh. is that if time were to have a second dimension and it, dimensions of space are always perpendicular to all other dimensions, it would almost require that that time dimension would be perpendicular <laughs> to yeah, linear time. I actually, I, yeah, <sighs> I, I wrote a I wrote a blog about that a little while ago. Uh -huh. uh, trying to trying to because because that's something that was stuck in my head like what what would a second dimension of time look like if there was one and uh so i i wrote this i wrote this blog about it and it goes into a lot of a lot of things but ba basically w the best i can figure and i'm not a scientist or physicist by any means but um you have to you have to start with uh okay we're on like let's say our timeline is the primary timeline mm -hmm. Well, the only way that you can have anything perpendicular is by points, you know, so you would have to have a parallel line next to us. So there would have to be a parallel timeline that was just slightly like maybe just one little difference or something, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, and, and so that that kind of goes into multiple uh, multiple world theory. Yeah. And that's the only way that I can really figure this out and how this would work. So if you were to. uh Oh, oh, and, and also Planck time has something to do with this too. You know, time, as we know it, it it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, you can only you can only divide it down to a certain point, and it's called a Planck time. It's I think ten to the minus forty five seconds or something like that. It's a really incredibly short amount of time. But once you get down to that short of time. You can't divide it anymore. Time, time is kind of like a film strip with, with, uh, with a bunch of pictures that just, yeah, they, they fly randomly through, and it gives the illusion of, of like a smooth transition through time, but it, it's it's really not. So, um, well, we would have that perpendicular, you know, as well, but it would be, uh, it, it it would be, you know, other parallel universes, I guess. So if you were to travel perpendicular in time, you would actually be traveling within the same normal Planck time as, as you know, we, 
as you would be when you started, but you would be traveling through all these other multiple universes rapidly. Um, I guess as fast as the normal flow of time. So you would travel through, you know, 10 to the 10 to 10 to the 43 universes, you know, within one normal second or whatever. Um, now I believe that because, uh, if this is true, this is just all out speculation. I, I actually, this is kind of cool because I've never talked about this on air before. <laughs> I think you, I, I think you did that to me last time too. I, I, I have a <laughs> habit of drawing my guests into really, really rough territory because it's just, <laughs> it's just, it's a ton of fun for me because I live here, Josh, you know, I'm asking myself the same questions. And um, yeah. go ahead, go ahead. You, where were you going with that? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I live here too. It's amazing. But yeah, so you know, I believe that uh, there would be an order to it. You know, the the Planck times within our normal flow of time, they're not out of order and random. A lot of times, uh, when we think of multiple universes, uh, we we think that it would just be random and and just kind of all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, there, there's an order to it, just like the Planck times in our normal flow of time has an order. I believe that if there is a perpendicular time, there would be an order to it, too. So there I, I don't know what it would look like traveling through all those universes, but it might it might just look kind of the same as what we're dealing with now. And and, and I mean, if you think of a normal graph, you know, an X and Y axis, if you if you take out the X and Y that, you know, says what the lines are and you just turn it 90 degrees you can't tell the difference it looks the exact same so i i think that it would kind of be like that um or at least sim you know s sort of similar in a way but instead of going through uh plank times you would be going through universes but then again who's not to say that we're doing that now maybe we are on the y-axis of time and every plank time is a separate universe and, and that that goes into a whole Oh, just a whole mess. Well, of stuff. <laughs> Josh, let me just mess you up a little bit more before we get back to the Garden of Eden, because you know this is something that I've been really getting it. one. Okay, one um, in Ephesians chapter two verse six, it says we have been raised up and seated with Christ in heavenly places. That means, yeah. and we, yeah, you know, I, I turned you loose a bit on this one the first time you were on, and you know, you were kind of going the same direction. It's like, you know, we exist in heaven spiritually while we exist on earth physically. It's absolutely it's a, we exist across that dimensional space and we occupy it all simultaneously. But if heaven is at the higher or highest dimensions of existence, then what about all that spanning in between? What really passes through the Christian spirit from a dimensional standpoint? The other verse that's really intriguing is this verse in Ephesians also, which says that he has made known his wisdom by the church to the principalities and the powers in the heavenly places. Another verse people just like to, you know, gloss over. It was like, oh, I don't know what that means, you know. But what does that speak to the to the to the uh, calling or the purpose that God has established for the heavenly or extra dimensional purpose of Christians? Yeah. It, 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 it and and so you know then you're left with speculation again. But it is really it brings our view of who we are and what we're here to do to another level. I mean, it's, it's really exciting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and quantum creation, I, I ended, I ended the book in the, in the last chapter, uh, that, that whole chapter is about how God has, when we get saved, God has brought us outside of time. You know, we, we don't know it cause we're stuck in time, but we're there too, because we're outside of time at the same because from God's perspective, he sees us seated with him already. So that means we're already there. And mm -hmm. that that kind of gives a whole new look on what the experience of death would be like. I, I kind of, you know, I'm, Paul uses uh, the illusion a lot of, of uh, being asleep and waking up, you know, to talk about life and death. I, I, I think he's actually being more literal than we give him credit for. I, I think that when when we pass on, it will, in a lot of sense, be like waking up and then we'll real. oh, this is the real reality. Of course. How did I not see it? Just like when uh, we wake up from a really weird dream or something. And uh, in the dream, we think we're awake and we're going through normal life, even though all these crazy things are happening. But when we wake up, we realize, oh, of course, this is the reality. I, I think 
when we pass on, it's going to be like that. I think we're going to wake up, but we're going to realize we were there the whole time. That's... Just like in a, in a dream, you, you don't remember falling asleep ever. You know, you, you, you in a dream, you're just there in the dream. When you wake up, you realize you were there in bed the whole time. I, I think that's what it's going to be like. Well, I think you're absolutely right, Josh, because in the book of Philippians, it literally says, uh, for we are citizens in heaven – from which we await the coming of yep. our Lord Jesus Christ. H how do you wait from heaven if you're not there? It, it, see, so the language Absolutely. indicates where we are occupying. Th th that's that's yep. just the way you have to read the text. There's no other way to read, unless you just redefine it, you know, and, and pretend just throw it out. You can't. You can't do that. That's right. Okay, Josh. Now, see, I'm supposed to be interviewing you, and here we are. I've completely lost control of this interview. <laughs> like we're these, supposed these to be. Are, these are <laughs> these are my favorite kinds of interviews. I, I I love being you know getting into discussions and talking about this stuff. You know, it's 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 great. <laughs> it is great, Josh, and and this is where I you know I really go off on on the whole kingdom concept and everything I'm always talking about kingdom on this program and so forth but I want to come back to the garden of eden because you you know yeah. you're introducing the garden of eden as a place that may have been created outside of time now yeah. how does that factor in to earth because here we have genesis chapter 1 god creates the earth you know and he puts all the vegetation on earth. He puts man in the garden. Well, he creates man and then he places him in the garden. Um, I believe, and, and uh, you know, I'm going to turn this over to you and let, let us let you tell our audience what you believe. I believe that God created heaven and earth in alignment. There, there was a full yeah. alignment of realms. They all lined up. And when sin happened, earth and heaven went out of alignment and then God in the new heavens and the new earth in, intends to realign heaven and earth. But how do you see that tension and, you know, with the Garden of Eden going on? Yeah, yeah. And that, that's a really good way to describe it. And, uh, you know, and I, I, I agree. The way, the way that I look at creation in itself, I, I, I believe before the fall, the, the original creation, I guess, before the fall, um, I believe that earth and well really the universe all, all of phys physical you know the three spaces of or, or three dimensions of space that that we know was really just a section of a, a three-dimensional slice of uh, a higher dimensional construct of all of heaven hmm. so when it says the heaven and the earth you know i i think the earth was was just uh i, I don't really know how else to describe it as just a section uh, of of a higher construct it would be like uh you know the whole flatland analogy the two-dimensional uh plane uh idea if you put a ball you know halfway in in flatland you know it would just look like a circle to flatlanders and they would see the circle uh they wouldn't be able to get the whole shape because their their perception is limited it's it's kind of like that I, I i believe that creation in itself is just a subset of something you know larger um, now, what, what I believe happened is after the fall, because sin was now introduced, um, there was a, a, a split of dimensions. So, and I and it happened at between the third and the fourth, to where now, <clears throat> and I and I believe this is this is why they were kicked out of the garden. The, the garden, I don't believe necessarily was subject to this split because they were kicked out adam and eve were kicked out of the garden you know they hmm. weren't allowed to go back in because the the tree of life was there and the the, the cherubim guarded it oh and that flaming sword I, I believe that that may have been what actually caused the split in the first place god may have sent that flaming sword to in, in a sense sever off uh the the first three dimensions from the 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 rest however many they are there are um so that way, uh, now, now it's it's kind of like a quarantine situation, you know. Now sin is is kind of quarantined here on Earth, uh, and we don't have access to the Tree of Life, so we can't become, you know, immortal in that way without 
you know, and then and then just die in our or, or uh, be, live forever in our sins and basically become like the you know like the fallen angels or something. Um, but but we have something far better. We have Jesus Christ. You know, we have uh, His salvation that that doesn't only bring us into eternity, but it, it cleanses off the disease of sin, and uh, and we can be taken out of that quarantine. You know, out of the quarantine zone when uh, when we pass on. So I th- that's that's kind of uh, I guess kind of like a roundabout way of how I how I think about it. You know, I don't have all the all the T's crossed or the I's dotted or anything, but um, that that's generally kind of how I how I how I see it now. <laughs> Josh, you bring up something extremely fascinating with everything you've said, and I when I was reading your book. You know, it jumped out at me. Now that you're talking, like it's like, you know, I'm, I'm I feel like I'm getting punched in the head right now because it's like, oh, wow, duh. <laughs> um, the sword. You you said that you feel the sword may have been the element that God chose to use in order to divide the Garden of Eden from the rest of Earth, which continued in our space time. And right. That means that God would use swords, flaming swords, to divide realms. Right. Now, think about this for a minute, because you know this is like blowing up in my head, and I'll, I'll let you get a chance to comment, you know, on this. But you know, what does Jesus do at the Battle of Armageddon when he destroys the New World Order, the Antichrist, and everything at his coming? Well, he puts a sword out of his mouth that is the final judgment on that it divides it and then there is a progression into a new situation um but then the bible goes on and it says that we have been given the sword of the spirit which is the word of god now the word of god you know is interesting because the bible also says that his word is forever established in heaven and it's like when we agree with that word, it can connect us to that realm. When we believe on the word who is Jesus Christ, it connects us to that realm. It connects us. That's salvation. When we believe with what he said and agree upon it, it's like there's this ability for the sword to connect. And also, to it, Josh, all the time when I'm doing deliverance, we are using the sword of the spirit to divide people from powers in the heavenlies and their realms. Literally, that is the language that is effective in getting people set free and delivered. The sword of the spirit cutting off the attachment points from the people and their realms. It's like the sword has always had the purpose of either dividing realms or in some cases connecting them. It's like that weapon. And and this is... um. I don't know. This one's just blowing up in my head. Go ahead. I mean, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I, I think that the sword in Revelation is the same sword from Genesis. And you wow. know, I mean, what a perfect, what a perfect way for you know God to connect the whole story together. You know, like that. And, and it's interesting too because, um, you know, it says. Uh, Oh, I just had a really good thought. What was it? <laughs> I can't tell you, Josh. I wish I could. Oh, I just. <laughs> Come right, let me on, think man. About I I was oh 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 Ephesians uh-huh. uh, again in Ephesians six it, it um okay there's a lot of times with the with the armor of God that it says the sword is the only offensive weapon but really the 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 sword can be offensive and defensive yes so it can be in in my I guess way of thinking about it it can be used to uh it, it has dual purposes. It can be used to protect or attack, or or it can be used to sever or put back together. And I think that that's what we're looking at from Genesis to Revelation. In Genesis, the sword, you know, severed uh, the dimensions or, or, you know, however you want to look at it. But in, in Revelation, again, through cutting the enemy out, it puts those dimensions back so we can have access. The the, the sword puts it back together from when Genesis, it, it, it sliced it. Uh, so there's a dual purpose there. And, and actually, we can think about it, too. As if we think about uh, the dimensions of space as kind of stacked on top of each other, I mean, it's not really like that, but 
Um, it's kind of a good thought exercise. If we think about it like that, in Genesis, the sword came through to cut the uh, the third dimension from the fourth and above. So it's like a you know kind of like a horizontal cut. But in Revelation, to cut out the enemy, to cut out all that all that stuff of higher dimensions, really in all the dimensions, it's more of a vertical cut, you know, and it takes out a section of that 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 part of dimensionality that that's evil and corrupt, and that's how the first you know, horizontal cut is, is able to be put back, back together. So it, it, it's kind of like what was severed in Genesis is put back together in, in, in Revelation. It's, it's restored, and, you know, that's exactly what Jesus promised to do. And there's no way that anybody's going to be able to convince me that thousands of years ago people knew enough about quantum physics to be able to describe things in this way. It's, <laughs> you know, they, they, this wasn't just guesswork. I mean, th this was holy revelations from God that people wrote down in the Bible. And the more that we learn about science and things like that, the more we realize, wow, they, they had it right. You know, they may have used different terminology, but they, they knew what they were talking about way more than we know today. And it, ju it just blows my mind. <laughs> All right. So this is really exciting. Now let's take it back to some other subjects you talk about in your book. Lamasu and Shadu. What do they have to do with pillars and what are they? Yeah, they um the Lamassu and Shadu were um they were the uh, I, I I look at them as fallen cherubim now. Uh, I, I and I'll get into why, but the, the nations surrounding Israel way, you know, back in ancient times um, they had these things called Lamassu and Shadu, and they they would erect statues in in their images. Uh, basically, it looks like a, like a human head on top of a uh, the body of a bull or a lion, and they would use these um, statues to protect the entrances to their palaces. There would be one on each side of of the entr entrance. Um, now, th this is a complete antithesis of the biblical cherubim, which we get the description in uh, Ezekiel, which says basically that they have like a humanoid uh, body shape, sort of, but the, and animal heads. Well, the, the antithesis of that is a human head with the body of an animal. Um, so that's why I, I look at these as the, the, the fall, the fallen angels, the fallen cherubim, specifically that class, and also because the other nations were, were worshiping these things. Mm -hmm. um, but the interesting thing is uh, what this has to do with pillars. When, when they would erect these statues, they would give them each five legs. Uh, so when you looked at it from the side, it would look like it was walking, and when you looked at it from the front, it would look like it was standing still because it had five legs. And I, and that might be kind of confusing to picture, but I have pictures in the book if uh, people are interested. Um, so what that has, and and also uh, there would be uh, th these these two things uh, would be supporting two pillars. So what this has to do with pillars and why all this is important, uh, it goes back to a book uh, called Forbidden Secrets of the Labyrinth, uh, The Awakened Ones, The Hidden Destiny of America, and The Day After Tomorrow by Mark Flynn, uh, who is the brother of the late Dave Flynn, who, who just did amazing work. Um, and Mark actually was kind enough to write the foreword of, of this book, which which was a complete honor for me. Uh, but in his book, he, uh, he, he puts – he puts an interesting idea out there concerning what pillars mean in architecture. And I actually have a quote here uh, from his book. Uh, a wedge or obstruction was set in place at the time when the union of God and men, heaven and earth, was interrupted. An appropriate illustration of this new state would be the symbol of pillars. The most rigid and graceful of architectural ed edifices were set in place after Eden and now symbolically separate heaven from uh, from earth. They were partly removed at the reconciliation between God and man that occurred through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Pillars that represent the physical separation of heaven and earth still exist. So that goes back to the garden. That, that, that was when that split in dimensions occurred. So the symbol of pillars is what, th that's what symbolizes it. So if that interpretation is correct, then we can see a connection when we look at the, the, the meanings of, of certain numbers. Um, e. W. Bullinger did a lot of research, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of your your listeners are probably already have somewhat of a background in in uh, you know biblical numerics and things like that. But um, 
So according according to Bollinger, uh, the number two signifies division, and you know that's where we get the pillar, the two pillars. Uh, four signifies creation, specifically material and physical, such as the earth. And then six is described this way. Uh, this is a quote uh, from E. W. Bollinger. Uh, six is either four plus two, i.e., man's world four with man's enmity to God two, brought in. Or it is five plus one, the grace of God made of none effect by man's addition to it or perversion or corruption of it. Or it is seven minus one, i.e. man's coming short of spiritual perfection. In any case, therefore, it has to do with man. It is the number of imperfection, the human number, the number of man as destitute of God, without God, without Christ. So that's the number six. Now, when we look at the uh, the meanings of the pillars and numbers in reference to the Lamb, Asu, and Shadu uh, in the front of these palaces, we can make a connection. Um, now, if we think of... Uh, remember that they have five legs each. So if we think of the legs of the Lamb Asu as sets of pillars, uh, we actually find there's a total of five sets in the legs alone because there's ten legs all together. You know, a pillar is two, so you, you have five sets uh, in the legs. Um, now, like we talked about earlier, the Lamb Asu and Shadu were used on either side of the palace doors to support uh, a set of pillars. So including that set, we would come to a total of six sets of pillars found within these cherubim like creatures, the fallen cherubim. So this shows the division of heaven and earth uh, due to man's defiance towards God. And that ties back to the original purpose of the cherubim, the garden of Eden. Now I know that's, that might be speculative, but I think it supports the idea that other ancient cultures understood the purpose and importance of the cherubim. I believe that, uh, you know, they didn't just guess at this stuff. You know, I, I, I believe that they were instructed to, con you know, construct these things in that way because uh, that's what they saw. And in ancient times, they had communications with these things. Um, so really, the, those those pillars and, and the Lamassu and Shadu in front of these palaces, uh, and, and think about it, you know, when, when somebody would enter into the palace, it was to talk to the ruler or the king. Well, they had to go through these pillars to do that, which is a total, the, these pillars is a, a, a complete, uh, it is a symbol of a complete defiance in God. Mm -hmm. So they had to throw off any, um, any, uh, association with God, the, the the true God that they had passed through these pillars, you know, symbolically by passing through these pillars to talk to the ruler of the land or, you know, the human ruler. Um, and, and so, I mean, it, it all, it all points to the, the, the future coming beast system and, you know, all that stuff, the antichrist, all that kind of stuff. But uh, it, it's really interesting that they understood this stuff in, in ancient time when they didn't even have those, those biblical beliefs, you know, uh, so that, that, I mean, that lends more, uh, evidence, I think, to the fact that the Bible is true. These things were fallen beings, just as the Bible, uh, describes, they still are fallen, but, you know, they, 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 they were fallen. They told people these things, they built these things to, uh, to honor them. And this is how it turned out to be. So it, it gives more evidence to all that, but that, that's the whole deal with the numbers and, and pillars. <laughs> Got it. Thank you for that. Yeah. <clears throat> Fascinating. Um, coming back to Vimanas, because we brought it up and then walked away from it in like the first 10 minutes, what have you concluded about these ancient vehicles called Vimanas? If I'm pronouncing that right. Well, this is the, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think, I don't know. I'm not, <laughs> I, I believe that's how you pronounce it. That's, that's how I say it. But, but you know, I, I, I think that this was. The, the, this was a really important thing to look at be, when I was writing this book because mm -hmm. it's so prevalent in ancient astronaut theory, and they use ancient Indian texts to support the, the idea that aliens came to Earth in ancient times. I don't think they were aliens. I think they were fallen angels or extra-dimensional beings, the same thing. But, um, but uh, to my surprise the ancient Indian texts basically say that they were extra dimensional. I mean, they don't use those terms, but when we look at the actual quotes, that's what they're describing. And, and, you know, I'll preface this too, by saying, uh, I, I look at 
these more of like historical documents. I, I don't think that we should be reading them to get any kind of spiritual influence or anything like that. I mean, spirituality wise, it's it's garbage. But when uh, when we have ancient texts of people saying that they saw things and, and they're writing them down, I, I think that they actually did see things, but they interpreted it as you know these gods or you know however they looked at it. But I, I believe that they did actually see these things. Um, so. Uh, well, there's the whole thing with the push pocket, but I'll I'll save that for people that want to get the book, mm-hmm. um, and that that is really interesting. But that'll take me on a tangent. That'll take like 20 minutes out of your show. Yes. So, um, but anyway, uh, so the manas they're mentioned in the Mahabharata, which is probably one of the most popular, you know, ancient Indian texts. But they're they're really prevalent. They're they're uh, really common in a text called the Bhagavata Purana, and that primarily focuses on Krishna, which in their religion, it's, it's the complete incarnation of Lord Vishnu, the Hindu God. And, um, so early on we, we, we learn of their, the, the Vimana's capability for flight. And the, these are like, you know, what the ancient alien crowd would, uh, would, would claim are the, the chariots of the gods are basically alien spaceships. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think that they are extra dimensional, uh vehicles for for fallen angels and things like that that are posing as gods and posing as aliens now but uh anyway here's a quote that that talks about uh their their capabilities for flight um a brilliant vimana flew down from the sky soft as petals of a rose in it were many eternal dwellers in vishnu's realm and then it named some of them and uh then uh, Dundakari embraced his brother Gokarna and climbed into the ship of the sky. All right, so I, on the surface, not a whole lot there, but really it, it speaks volumes. For one thing, it says that this had the capability of flight, and it says that it's from uh, the the place of, of Vishnu's realm, where many eternal dwellers are. You know, so it, it's extra dimensional. But what's really interesting is that regular people were able to climb in this thing and fly around. So there is physicality there. This isn't just, you know, a vision or something like that. Um, now there's, there's uh, way more telling quotes than just that. Um, here it says, uh, the Vimana flashed away into heaven beyond the stars, like a thought leaving a golden trail in the sky, which dissolved a few minutes and vanished above the perfect silence that had fallen on the gathering of men and the earth below. So it says it flashed away into heaven beyond the stars. They, If that was just talking about beyond the edge of the universe, they wouldn't have been able to see that. <laughs> so for, for yes. them to recognize that it's beyond the stars, it means it's beyond physical existence. This thing disappeared into a higher dimension. And it says that it even left a golden trail in the sky when it did that. Um, now, one of, probably one of the most telling um, uh, quotes is here uh, – let me find it here. Uh, yeah. All right. Wondrous Alaka, city of the king of the Yakshas and Guyakas, lord of the nine treasures, one of the Lokapalas, the masters of the earth, fairly swarms with Vamanas, which look like immense flying jewels cut like faceted discs which fly more quickly than light or time. And that's a direct quote from an ancient Indian text. So not only are, are these things like they, they look like flying jewels, so they're they're shiny, you know, they're they're cut like faceted discs. What does that sound like? And uh, they fly more quickly than light or time. Now that that if that's not extra dimensional, I don't know what is. For something for for one thing, it's impossible for just a physical thing to go faster than light. I mean, if it were to do that, if that was even possible, it would be going backwards in time because the faster that you go, the slower time goes. And when you're at the speed of light, time stops. So theoretically, if you were to go faster than that, you would be going backwards in time. But this thing is traveling faster than light or time. So it's going even faster than time itself. It's somehow able to speed up and not have time slow down but have time actually uh it it goes faster than time Uh, that that's that's only possible if it's an extra dimensional craft it has to be something outside of our normal physical you know physics uh and they're describing this thousands of years ago and 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 again unless they actually saw these things they're 
they didn't know enough about quantum physics to be able to describe things in this way if they were just trying to tell the story. Um, now, I believe that there are inaccuracies, of course, because they worshipped these things as gods, and they certainly were not, and they are not gods. They're, they're fallen angels and, uh, you know, sometimes demons, things like that. But the actual eyewitness accounts, I believe that they actually saw these things and recognized what they were able to do thousands of years ago so it it's it's mind-blowing <laughs> it it is mind-blowing and there's you know so many things to speculate on when you get into this you know questions that i'm not sure anyone really has the full answer to like um why did they need craft this is a, this is a big huge question if they were already extra dimensional if they were angels why did they need a craft if they can fly yeah uh, you know th there's questions like um where do you get matter that can dematerialize into another dimension? Is there matter on higher dimensional planes that can be brought into ours? There's a lot of uh, really interesting yeah. questions. And I, I, I believe. Go ahead. I want to hear what you believe. I want to know what Josh Peck. Oh believes. yeah, I, I go ahead. Bring say, it to I, me. I, I, <laughs> and, and this and this is just pure speculation because I don't have the answers to these either. You know, I, I only I can only look at it in the framework that I that I understand. But I you know I believe that there 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 is matter there is extra dimensional matter, and I believe that because uh, uh, this goes into particle physics. But um, it, it uh, the whole idea of what dark matter is the the reason that they know. Basically, dark matter is there's some type of matter out in the universe that makes up like 70 some odd percent or, or, or no, uh, that's dark energy uh, that makes up uh, 20 something percent of the universe. I might have that flipped. But anyway, uh, it makes up a lot more of the universe than we can explain um, by the the standard model of, of particle physics. So because they don't have anything else to call it, they just call it dark matter. They don't know what it is. But the reason that they know it's there is because of gravity. Now, interestingly enough. Gravity um, is the only force that can uh, essentially transcend dimensions. Gravitons themselves are free to flow through higher dimensions. So a an extra dimensional object, even if we can't see it, could still affect gravity. And I, I believe that that's what, that's what dark matter is. I, I, I think that it's extra dimensional. Um, matter that we're not able to perceive or we're not able to see because we're not of that. Now, if if a piece of that dark matter, if a piece of that extra dimensional uh, matter were to breach our dimensions, we would just see a three dimensional slice of it. We wouldn't we wouldn't know like like um, like let's say there was a a hypersphere, a sphere of four dimensions. Mm -hmm. If it were to pass through our dimension, it would just look like a sphere. To us, there there would be nothing to tell us that it has higher dimensions. Um, the stars could easily be extra dimensional. We would never know it. There there would be no way to. Uh, I mean, except for the gravity. I mean, if they're pulling more gravity than their oh, mass goodness. is accounting for, then Josh, then there there's there's got to be. If, yes? if you if you bring up stars, we're going to end up in a really big mess here because the Bible has some interesting things to say about stars. <laughs> I, I am just not ready to open oh, that Oh, I know. Oh, come on, Josh. Why are you doing it to me? All right. Hold on. <laughs> hold on. All right. Go so, for it. Go for it. Come Go on, man. It. In Revelation <laughs> chapter 12, it says the dragon drew a third of the stars to earth. Uh -huh. It does not say angels. It says stars. We exactly. interpret it as angels because Revelation chapter 1 refers to the seven stars as the seven angels of the seven churches and so we let the word define uh -huh. the word so we say revelation chapter 12 stars means angels there's that rebellion that every theologian loves to reference okay but in joseph's dream which is i believe is referenced in revelation chapter 12 as well uh talking yeah. about the 12 stars the garland of 12 stars he has a dream there's 12 stars and then there's the sun and the moon the sun was jacob his father the moon was his mother the 12 stars were the brothers and the 11 stars in his dream bowed to him the 12th star so the bible relates stars to both angels and humans 
Yeah. And then they're in the sky as well. Where does the connection get made? I, I see this. There's something so deep here because Josh, there is a type of witchcraft that actually works on the stars themselves to put people in bondage. I don't understand it yep. yet. Now, okay, <laughs> why do the three pyramids in Egypt align with the Orion system? Come on. Right. I don't know. What do you say, Josh Peck? Yeah, there's definitely something there. You know, I, I used to think, and, and also in Revelation 9, it talks about that uh, that a, a star fell from heaven having the keys to uh, the bottomless pit. And, and actually, and it's it's an angel. It's a fallen angel. I mean, it it's it has the keys. It open, you know, permission was given to this thing to open the open the open the pit. And uh, but it doesn't it doesn't start off saying that it's an angel. Josh, you know, that comes later. It starts off saying it was a star. <laughs> I always thought it was a singularly dimensional object of fire and gas. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just well, kidding. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just bringing a point home. This is called bringing a point home. <laughs> Folks, there's something going on here with stars, and I, I'm not alluding to the idea that I know what's going on here. This, and it's all Josh's fault. Say, Daniel, what are you doing on your program? <laughs> blame Josh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll take the blame. And, and, yeah, I mean, if it was, if it was a star – the story's done. I mean, the Earth would be engulfed in flames, and there would be nothing left. Thank you. It's not. It, it it can't be a real star, like in the at least not in the way that we think of stars. But what if, what if stars do have extra dimensions to them, and there's more than what we see? What if now this is like the fringiest fringe speculation thing, and I, I don't even know if it's if there's any truth to this. This is just me talking out loud, but um. What if the belief that stars and angels are the same thing is actually true, and we're just seeing a section of that angel? Uh, I, I mean, that, that's what they thought in the in, in, in ancient times. You know, they that's what the, when they looked at the stars, they thought they were angels. Maybe they were right. I don't. I I don't know. I'm 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 right in the same boat with you. I I don't know, but I love thinking about this stuff and talking about it. And and, and the Bible does seem. I mean. You could you could you could easily make an argument based just on the Bible to say that stars are angels, you know, that they're the same thing. Now, I wouldn't go as far as to do that, you know, and like write a, you know, I I I think it's an interesting thought, but I don't know if there's really enough there, but I mean, even descriptions of angels is you know, the seraphim being being flaming and you you know, uh made of fire and all this stuff. There, there seems to be some kind of connection. Now, may, maybe God created the stars as being just representative of the angels, you know. Uh, and, and, and certainly in God's creation, He puts aspects of Himself in His own creation all the time. Um, I mean, in in my new in my newest book that I'm working on now, uh, I talk about wave particle duality and how actually existence is made of waves, but when we look at it, we see particles. Uh, that's kind of like God and Jesus. You know, we can't see God face to face. When we look at God, we see Jesus. That's that's the representation of God that we can see. So when we have weird things like wave particle duality, I, I, I can look at that and I see God's fingerprints all over it. He's, he's using creation to explain an aspect of himself. Uh, and I talk a lot about that in Quantum Creation, too, as well as Cherubim Chariots and really all my books. But but it, it's it's interesting. So stars, it might just be a representation of, of angels, or it might be a three-dimensional slice of an angel itself. I, 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 I don't know, but it's, it's – wow, we got on a tangent, didn't we? <laughs> all right, so that brings me to this question, okay? What about the Sphinx and the Great Pyramid? Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, all right. So let me scroll down to my notes here because this is this is really interesting. Uh, OK, there's two extra biblical texts that I, I bring together for for that section of the book. Uh, it's kind of funny. We've been talking this long and we're only barely into chapter three. <laughs> but um, so uh, we have the account of Josephus and Jubilees and uh they're they're told they're they're telling about these things called the pillars of the children of Seth. Um, so jo Josephus wrote. Uh, well, actually, let me go back. 
No, that's right. Yeah, Josephus wrote, um, they, the children of Seth, also were the inventors of that peculiar sort of wisdom which is concerned with the heavenly bodies, speaking of stars and things, and their order, and that their inventions might not be lost before they were sufficiently known upon Adam's prediction that the world was to be, destro to be destroyed at one time by the force of fire and at another time by the violence and quantity of water. They made two pillars, one of brick <clears throat> and the other of stone. They inscribed their discoveries on them both, that in case the pillar of brick should be destroyed by the flood, the pillar of stone might remain and exhibit those discoveries to mankind and also inform them that there was another pillar of brick uh, uh, erected by them. Now this remains in the land of Syria, which is Egypt, to this day. So that was back in Josephus' day uh, a couple thousand years ago. Now in Jubilees, we get a little bit more information. It says, and he, uh, Canaan, found a writing which former generations had carved on the rock, and he read what was thereon, and he transcribed it and sinned owning to it, owing to it, for it contained the teaching of the watchers in accordance with which they used to observe the omens of the sun and moon and stars in all the signs of heaven. So if those accounts are to be taken as factual, that might help fill in some blanks. You know, what... What type of technology was in the world at that time, and where did it come from, and did it survive the worldwide flood? And I, I've heard other people talk about this. There's there's a really great book called, uh, uh, no pun intended. It's called the the Great Pyramid by Noah Hutchings, and um, that that's that that's an awesome book, uh, and it talks a little bit about this. Uh, and then there have been other researchers that have talked about this too. And a lot of times when they, for some reason, I, I think it's just a misunderstanding of the text. Um, not that I know so much or anything. I, I could be misunderstanding it. But but the a lot of times that I've heard this talked about, they, they'll say, well, Adam didn't know if the – if the flood or the fire was going to come first and that's why they built the two, but that that's not what the text says. It, it, it says they built two because I mean, it says that they, they, in case the first was taken over by the flood, the other would remain. So they knew the flood was coming first. Um, so, all right. So if we put those two together, there's not like a, there's not a whole lot of information given about these, these pillars and what they were. Uh, we're just told that, there's one of brick and one of stone, and uh, so they weren't sure if the pillar of brick would be destroyed by the flood, but in case it was, they built the, built the pillar of stone and inscribed the discoveries on both. And we're also told that at least the pillar of stone remained in Egypt, uh, at least in the days of Josephus. And then we're told that those pillars contain the teachings of the watchers and that it was considered sinful to follow those teachings. So... That begs the question, is there anything in Egypt that may point to more answers concerning these pillars? And I put forth in the book, I believe it might be the Sphinx and the Great Pyramid. Uh, you know, the word pillar doesn't really, it doesn't just mean like an obelisk kind of thing. It just, it's just a structure, you know, it, it can have really any shape. Um, now, there, there's a theory that, and it's a little controversial, but the, there, there's a theory that uh, the pyramid was actually instead of being quarried and all that stuff, it was it, it, by stone. It was actually uh, created by, by – they, they made bricks, you know. And, it, it, and there's there's good evidence for that, and I put links in the, in the book to if people are interested in that. But the interesting thing about the pyramid, besides the fact that it's really tall and all the, the, the coating that used to be on it is washed off, um, the capstone is gone. Uh, it has a missing capstone at the very top. So let's say, just for pure speculation, let's say that the pyramid was one of the pillars and the capstone contained the teachings of the watchers. Um, now, when this, uh, when the flood came, it could have washed away the capstone. Maybe it's in the bottom of the ocean or something now. I don't know. But it could have washed that away. So that brings us to the Sphinx, which... I believe could be the pillar of stone because uh, when you look at the history of the Sphinx, um, they, they were able to deduce not only that it, it had gone through a time of uh, a cataclysm, a, a flood, you, you, there's actual evidence on the Sphinx itself that it went through a flood, um, but also that it was carved out of a, a larger rock. Um, the way that they, the historian that, 
you know, subscribe to this line of thinking, describe it as uh, there was a, you know, there used to be just a huge rock where the Sphinx is now, and then an unknown civilization um, carved it into some kind of unknown structure. They don't, they don't know what that was. So let's say that that unknown civilization was the children of Seth, and then they carved the Watcher stuff on there. And and then the flood came, washed away the capstone from the pyramid, and then the Sphinx is left with these watchers. So then Canaan comes along, sees the sees the inscription, and sins according to it. Well, then the historians say, uh, and I'm filling in the blanks of historians here, but but the historians say that at some point, at, at some time after the original carving, whatever that was, uh, they decided to. Uh, carve it again into the shape of the, the the head of the sphinx and then they dug around it to make the body um so there was something there it seems like they were trying to get rid of something maybe maybe and this is really speculative but maybe that was the teaching of the watchers after canaan whatever he did it's not specific but after he sinned according to it maybe that was so bad that they got they just got rid of the inscriptions um so that's uh, in a nutshell. That's kind of the the idea between be, behind the 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 Great Pyramid and the and the Sphinx. They they may have at one time contained inscriptions of the teachings of the Watchers, and that may have been talked about in the books of Jubilees and uh, and Josephus. Okay, <clears throat> you have some really interesting stuff <laughs> about <laughs> uh, the two witnesses. So I'm just going to turn you loose on that. What, what what is Josh Peck saying about the two witnesses at this point in his research? Yeah, uh, well, one of the one of the big mysteries um, in eschatology nowadays is, and I don't claim to have. There are so many different ideas. I, I don't claim to have, you know, the the absolute truth. This is just this is just me talking to this mystery of who. Uh, who the two witnesses are. Uh, I used to think that Elijah and Enoch were the two witnesses, and I was, I was dead set on that. I was like, no, it's got got to be Enoch and Elijah. It, it's you know, it's not Moses. It's not you know all these other things. It's it's got to be them. But when I really looked into this, and I wanted to look into it because you know it, it had to do with the theme of the book, and, and you know, it's just good Bible study anyway, and it has to do with prophecy. I'm big big into that. Um, I wanted to see, and, and I, I'm to the point now where I believe any any question that we could have that is commonly debated, there is at least an answer in the Bible. Now, people might interpret that answer different ways and come up with different ideas, but that's just our own you know, flawed perception. But I believe that the Bible does have answers to our questions. So that was a question I had, who are the two witnesses? Mm -hmm. um, so I used to think Elijah and Enoch, and uh, but... Then I then once once I got into all this quantum physics stuff, I I started to wonder, you know, is there something more there? You know, maybe, maybe because they get in a sense raptured, you know, after after they die, are are they extra dimensional? I mean, if they were Elijah and Enoch, we would we would suppose them to be extra dimensional. But is that what the Bible describes? Um, so he, here's some here's some Bible quotes for it. Um, this is. Revelation, oh, that's a big chunk of text. Well, I'll read fast. <laughs> Revelation 11, 3 through 12. Um, it says, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of earth. That references back to uh, Zechariah. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceeded out of their mouth and devour their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over the waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with their plagues as often as they will. And I, I think that's where people get the Moses idea because that's kind of like Moses and Aaron with the plagues and everything. Um, and when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the streets of that great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. There's the Egypt, another uh, reference to Moses, where, our, where also our Lord was crucified. And, that, and that's an interesting passage. Mm -hmm. Um and, and they of the people in kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three and a half, 
three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwell in uh, on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies behind them stood. Okay, so there's a lot of information there and more than enough to warrant a really deep, in-depth and exhaustive study. But uh, we, we, don't, we only really need to look at a few facts to, uh, to get our heads around this. Now, we, we read that these two men will have special abilities like breathing fire, causing droughts, turning water to blood. And those could cause the reader to assume these men are Elijah and Moses, as they, they're credited for similar acts you know, during their lives and ministries. Uh, but we got to remember that ultimately, this type of power comes from God himself, and it's not necessarily a natural ability that these men have. So just because they can do these things doesn't mean that they were like born that way or they're some superhuman. It could be, could be regular human with, you know, just like Moses and Elijah were. Uh, that have been given special abilities by God. So we also read, um, and, and this, this, this I think is like the key detail to tell us if these men are in fact uh, Moses, Elijah, or Enoch. We read that the beast will overcome and kill the two witnesses. After three and a half days, they will rise from the dead and ascend into heaven. Death and resurrection are the two main details to find out who these men are. So automatically, I believe, we can rule Moses out. Moses already lived and died. Um, he, the book of Hebrews says it's appointed unto men to die once to die, but after this, the judgment. So Moses already died. He's out, in my opinion. Um, he can't die again. So therefore, if Hebrews 9.27 is to be correct, he, he's, he's not going to die again. But what about Enoch and Elijah? We, we looked at the passages that tell us neither of them died physically. You know, I, I mentioned those, or I, I think I did. Uh, you know, Enoch was, was uh, uh, says he walked with God and then he was not, for God took him. That's Enoch. And then Elijah was taken up in the whirlwind. So they didn't die. They were, in a sense, translated or, you know, some could say rapped. Sure, that, that, that's totally fine to say that. But um, so they didn't die physically, but they were taken into heaven. So uh, are they waiting in heaven for their chance to die? First uh, Corinthians 1550 tells us, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit in corruption. So, uh, and, and, and remember, they were translated so flesh and blood uh biologically biological physicality you know as we know it can't inherit the kingdom of god so that's why enoch and presumably elijah were translated they were given new uh spiritual extra dimensional bodies that they could enter heaven and be face to face with god um supported by what god himself said in, in exodus 33 20 he said uh and, and thou uh, canst, uh, you know, cannot see my face, uh, for there shall no man see me and live. So Elijah and Enoch never knew death, and I, I don't believe they ever will know death. They've they've been translated. Um, they have their new bodies. They've the the two witnesses have not been translated yet, as it's written to uh, that that's written to happen after they die and are resurrected. Uh, so if they if this was Elijah and Enoch, they would already have their new bodies. You can't you know they'd be immortal. You can't kill those guys. <laughs> but they're uh, so Elijah and Enoch are already in their new bodies. They can't be killed. So, uh, well then who are the two witnesses? And and that's something that I still wonder. Um, I I don't know if if I'm being perfectly honest, I really don't know. But I I believe that it's just they're not going to be eternal um, until after they die anyway. Uh, I don't think we're going to know their true identity until they come on the scene, but they have the, they, they're able to die. I, I, they are going to be resurrected after they die. I think that these are going to be two normal human beings that are born into the time when God needs them to be born into. And uh, that God is going to give them special abilities just as he has done all throughout the Bible. He's used just regular, Killer people to to fulfill his uh, his his wishes. I think he's going to do that again. So I don't think the two witnesses have to be anything 
a angelic or any any people that have already died or or have been raptured or you know i i don't think that I, I, with what the text says and the evidence that we're given, I, I don't think that can apply. I think they're just going to be two regular, normal people that God's going to call for for that purpose. So that's, now, now, as far as who those people are, I have no idea. <laughs> and this is a common trap. I've met more than one individual that has confessed to me at one point or another in their life. They felt like they were supposed to be one of the two witnesses and most of them oh, are just I know. <laughs> very happy that they didn't run with that. There have been people that did. And they're, yeah. you know, I mean, <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, I noticed that you, well, and, and this is a, uh, oh, go ahead, go ahead. What else were you going to say? Well, yeah, I, 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 and I'll say anybody that says that I don't pay any attention to. I, I look at that. I, I, I think that's just crazy. If somebody comes up to me and they're totally comfortable with saying, Josh, I think I'm one of the two witnesses. Ah, uh, no, you're crazy. It's just, it's no. <laughs> For one thing, there it says that they're they're uh, olive tree or olive branches or something like that. That that that's a reference to Israel. I think they're going to be Israeli. I think they're going to be Jewish. You know, and probably born in that area since that's where everything is happening at that time. You know, um, so I don't, I don't think they're going to be American that just travel over there. You know, I don't think the text says that. Well, uh, but um, they, they, they might not even know who they are until they're called for that purpose. Moses had no idea what he was going to amount to until he was called for his purpose. And even then he was really apprehensive about it. You know, he, he, <laughs> he, he didn't want anything to do with it. He didn't think he could. And, 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 you know, it, and it humbled him. I, I think that the witnesses are going to be like that too. I, I think that they're going to be humble. Uh, and until they can actually breathe fire and can do all this stuff, I don't think that the actual witnesses are going to be walking around claiming that they're the two witnesses because it's not the time for that yet. You know, God has an appointed time for everything. Uh, I, I mean, even when Jesus himself didn't even start saying that he was the Messiah, you know, publicly and uh, until the right time for that was, you know, a few people knew and there, there were little things, but it wasn't like, oh, hi, I'm, uh, you know, like, like just people, I think that they're one of the two witnesses. I, I am one of the two witnesses. And it's like, well, good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you're not. <laughs> but yeah, it's. Yeah, it's it, it's one of my little annoyances with with some people, and I, right. I I think that when people say that, it discredits the church, and you know there's there's a lot of consequences to that because if if everybody that thought we'd have like one or two hundred of the two witnesses, like since since I've been on Facebook and stuff, I I've seen at least a couple hundred people claiming that and saying, well, God told me I'm one. Of, Mm, I don't think so. <laughs> well, and that leads us to another side uh, of this Yeah, you question. got me off on a tangent. Again. Well, <laughs> I mean, you, you get into it in your book, and you talk about some of these things that you pointed out. You know, and there's really two views. Obviously, you take the view that the two witnesses are going to be individual human beings. Yeah. Which I, le I personally still at this point lean towards that because they die and are dead in the street for three days. Yeah. But there is another view that supposes that the two witnesses are indicative of groups of people like yeah. the church and Israel or um, some other kind of dividing line between two groups prophets and apostles i've heard um that are, it's 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 a corporate witness and not a singular witness and some people have said well this would explain the phenomena of so many people coming out and, and believing that god had told them they're one of the the two witnesses and i've i've pondered this and um you know i, I think we both have a friend that's written a quite an extensive look into this perspective. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's definitely got some, some merit, but at the same time, you know, it, it's, it's going to definitely be interesting to see how it actually plays out because there's a number of ways this thing could spin. And the idea that they're going to be dead in the city for three days, that to me is, is it, well, that's tough to put on a whole, corporate group of people like everyone's dead for three days you know but that, that's my biggest yeah. hang up right now but uh, you know um without without nailing you know this one another thing i've thought just just off the top of my head 
interesting because you did say that it has to do with the book of Zechariah, and it does. In the book of Zechariah, there were two witnesses. The types and shadows of the two witnesses in Revelation were Joshua the high priest and the the governor, um, whose name was something I can't remember at this. Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel and Joshua right. the high priest were the two witnesses in the book of Zechariah. So you have... A king and a priest, basically. And it's it's just really interesting to take that and look at Revelation 1 6 and say, Oh yeah, we are the kingdom of priests. We are kings and priests. And there's a lot of connections, different ways you can flow through this. I don't know. Here's the thing. You also talk yeah. about <laughs> it's like just leave that one alone. <laughs> um the Zechariah chapter five. Okay. Really interesting passage. Uh people don't like to talk about it because it's just you know kind of hard to put context on you have a scroll you have an ephah you have a woman being taken to have a house built for her i mean it's like uh, what, uh, what do you do with that a lot <laughs> <laughs> well yeah i uh <laughs> yeah in um and there really is there really is a lot i i, I wrote a whole chapter which actually i didn't plan for this but it actually turned out to be chapter five in the book which is kind of funny because you know it's zechariah but um i i I took the the whole chapter to really get into what the scroll the ephah and uh and and uh what was the other the horses i think was the other thing uh the scroll the ephah and let's see scrolling down yeah yeah the horses uh really what these are because there are some that believe that this well primarily on the scroll and the ephah there, there are some that believe that they're both just visions and that's it i don't think that's true but they it, it's part of the truth but i don't think that's totally true now there are some that say that they are both vehicles extra dimensional vehicles uh that zechariah is seeing i i don't believe that's the whole truth either uh i i think both those views have a piece of the truth i i think the scroll was a vision. I don't think that that is talking about like the cigar shaped UFO. That that was a possibility I was looking into because I, I saw a lot of posts online about it and I, I wanted to look at and see if there was anything to that. Um, I, I actually, I, I think that the scroll Zechariah saw is the same scroll that, uh, and this again goes back to some work done by Chuck Missler, um, the same scroll that Jesus opens only when Zechariah is seeing it, the seals have already been broken because the, the, it it's not sealed. Um, so it's kind of a weird backwards kind of time thing, which is pretty cool. Hmm. But um, when, and I, and I get into a whole bunch of reasons as to why in the book and, you know, I, I get into the Hebrew and really get into what this vision is, is saying. And I, I believe it's prophetic for, you know, for the end times. Um, but then we have the ephah and this, I do believe uh is representative of a of a craft uh and i i put a picture of an ephah in the book so people can see it it looks just like the typical flying saucer shape um now what's interesting about this is it says um let's see this is zechariah 5 i think yeah 5 verses 5 through 11 uh then the angel that talked to me went forth and said unto me lift up now thine eyes and see what is this that goeth forth and i said what is it and he said this is an ephah that goeth forth he said moreover this is their resemblance through all the earth now i'll stop there it, it says their resemblance resemblance meaning plural multiple even though uh zechariah is only seeing one of these so the angel here is referencing something else. He's saying that this is their resemblance. This is, this is what they look like uh, all throughout the earth. All right. So continuing in verse seven and behold, there is lifted up a talent of lead. And this is a woman that sitteth in the midst of the ephah. And he said, this is wickedness. And he cast it into the midst of the ephah and he cast the weight of lead upon the mouth thereof. Then I lifted then lifted I up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came out two women, and the wind was in their wings, for they had wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted up the ephah between the earth and heaven. And then I said to the angel that talked with me, whither 
do these bear the ephod, and he said unto me, to build an house in the land of Shinar, and it shall be established and set there upon our own base. Uh, so verses 5 and 6 gave, a, gave us the basic setup of that vision. And again, it says this is their resemblance. Now what's interesting is in the Hebrew, that word resemblance could just as easily mean I, which is, which is weird. Um, and there have even been some theologians that, that have thought that to be the case. Now if that's referring to I instead of resemblance, that, that adds a whole new dimension to this passage some some have attributed that to depictions of the all-seeing eye connected with the illuminati uh others would take it back to the idea of satan and his eye whose establishment uh is destroyed by the hand of god you know when you look at the um when you look at the the hebrew letters of uh of, of jesus I, I think it's jesus name of yeshua uh yeah it, it, mm -hmm. every hebrew letter has a meaning to it so when you look at the individual letters um, it actually means uh, the something like uh, the hand that destroys the establishment of the eye. Um, and it's talking about Jesus overcoming the enemy. Mm -hmm. So, uh, let's see. Interestingly to know also is the word used for resemblance is actually that same Hebrew letter, I-N, which is just a letter that means I in, in Yeshua's name. Um so if the, if that ephah is their eye instead of their resemblance, that that might there might be an interesting parallel there. Um, seeing that it's tied with the name of Yeshua, if this is the enemy's version of that, then this would be you know the antithesis of Christ or the Antichrist, uh, some sort of theology that it's promoting. Um, now that th and that's why I that, that, that's why I believe it has the form of what we would recognize as. Uh, uh, flying saucer shaped UFO. I think that that's a clue. I, I, I think this whole vision is um, tied to the alien deception. I do believe that that is hmm. the what's going to cause the apostasy and you know all that stuff and and tear the world away from God uh, is going to be this this alien deception thing. And I think that this is a this is a prophecy of that. Um, we have we have uh, the, the woman, which a, a lot of times when used symbolically and this is not literal women are held just as in high regards as men in the bible regardless what people want to say they're equal you know we may have different jobs but they're equal okay but uh in 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 uh symbolically uh a lot of times women represent a uh, a false theology or, or like a false belief and, and usually it's it's like prostitutes or something like that it'll be that type of you know because there there are visions of virtuous women too that represent the church so you know it's it's not mm -hmm. it's not trying to like dog on women or anything like that but uh so what we have here is a, a false theology that that's that's against christ or you know it's anti-christ in nature um, in this, in surrounded by this ephah thing, and uh, and th that is the symbol of this alien deception is the typical flying saucer. Now, what's interesting too, which gives another clue, is it says that it's planted in the in in the plains of Shinar, and that is the first time way way back in Genesis. That's the first time that mankind had gathered to form a one world government and religion. Like when you look in the Hebrew, it it actually says that it, it says. It says that they were of one language and one speech, which or something like that, which would sound like the same thing, but it's not. It means one, one, uh, one, one of those words does mean speech, like talking, and then one means like a thought process, a line of thinking, a a, a, a religion, really. So there's a uh, back in Genesis, there was a one world government, one world religion, just like we're told in Re uh, Revelation that it's going to be again, um, and that's the first time that mankind all came together uh you know after the flood all all came together to try to petition the fallen angels uh to come back and, and actually if we um if we take the book of jasher is true and i i look at it as just a history book you know it probably has some inaccuracies i don't think it's it's uh you know inspired text or anything but um but it it, it actually says in there that their plan it, it, with the uh tower of babel was that they were going to they were going to go up to heaven. They were going to kill God, and they were going to put their idols in God in God's throne room. Um, and that goes into a whole other line of study of what the tower was, and you know, all that. But but basically, the, the idea that 
this deception, this this false theology around this ephah is planted in the plains of Shinar. It's a clue that takes us back to that time and what happened at that time. Um, I talked about in my, my first book, Disclosure, that Nimrod was really the first Antichrist, uh, at least po post-flood. Um, there was probably plenty more pre-flood, but uh, post-flood, Nimrod was the first Antichrist. And we can use... The example of Nimrod is a type or shadow of the coming Antichrist, the coming beast system, you know, all all, all that stuff. And it's pointing back to that. So that's why I think it starts with this alien deception thing. And I, I, I think that the uh, the vision of the ephah here is is speaking to that point and giving us a, a, a clue about that. Very, very interesting, Josh. That's Pratt. it. <laughs> 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 wow. Well, I think that that really is um, a great note to uh, end the program on. Really, some great meat for people to chew on and study. And man, yeah, I mean, your book is because we're not even halfway through it at this point, and we'll have to have you come back on, and you will right. be a guest back on my program soon enough. Uh, so don't yeah. worry about that. But uh, folks, you know. Josh Peck has written a book. It's called Cherubim Chariots. It's really easy to read. It is not written like it was written by a theologian. It's written by a guy who just wants you to understand the ideas he's putting forth so that you can digest them. And I really appreciate Josh, Josh Peck's writing for that very reason. Um, Josh, why don't you tell us a little bit about where they can get your book and uh, some of the things that you're doing personally in ministry before we close out this program? Sure. Uh all my all my materials are at uh, ministudyministry.com. And actually right now, uh, Skywatch TV has been nice enough to get some of my books and put together a package. If people want to get Quantum Creation and Cherubim Chariots, there's a link on my website. Uh, or they can go to the Skywatch TV website, uh, skywatchtv.com. And you can get both for, I think it's $29.95 right now, which is cheaper than it would be to get them individually. Um, so it's a great deal. People should do that. Uh, I also have all my information about my uh, about my show, The Sharpening, which I, I have to get you on, uh, Dan. I, I'd love to have you on as a guest uh, sometime soon. Uh, I'll be in touch with you about that. But it's called uh, it's called The Sharpening. I have all the information on ministudyministry.com, or um, people can go to youtube.com backslash uh, Josh Peck Disclosure and subscribe uh, to me on YouTube. I'm also heavily on Facebook more than I need to be. I'm always on there. And if people want to email me, uh, it's uh, Josh Peck Disclosure at gmail.com. Um, I'm always happy to answer emails and answer questions. And, uh, you know, so people can feel free to get a hold of me. Um, as far as what I'm doing in ministry, I have, well, I have my, my show. I have regular guests on like, like you do. And, um, you know, just other authors and researchers in the fringe and talk about their books and, you know, it, it, they usually run about an hour, hour and a half. So, um, uh, so I do that and, uh, I'm currently working on, uh, a new book, um, which is probably a little too early to talk too much about, but if people want some clues as to what's going to be in there they can subscribe to my newsletter on ministry.com or they can check out my blog i have written some stuff that will be in the book in the new book uh in, in the blog and and really i well what i can say is the book has to do with cern the large hadron collider the discovery of the higgs boson in 2012 and what all of that has to do with prophecy and why uh it's so important to understand uh, certain aspects of quantum physics with what we're going to have to deal with in the future. And I promise this stuff is not too complicated for the general public to understand. I, I graduated with a 2.6 in high school, so I am by far not a genius or anything like that. And I can understand it just fine, and so so can anyone listening. And and uh, uh, so don't listen to the scientists when they try to make things sound too confusing. They, they like to do that. Because a lot of them are elitists, but it doesn't have to be that way. So, um, anyways, th th that's that's the new book that I'm working on. I'm also putting together a book based on interviews that I, I've done with uh, some of the top researchers in the in in the field, and it's all about spiritual warfare. It's called uh, Spiritual Warfare in the 21st Century, um, and, and th this really it's a collection of. Uh, 
like I said, collection of interviews based on who the enemy is, uh, what what we can do uh, in, in terms of spiritual warfare, how we can combat against these things in all different areas. I mean, we talk. Uh, we have Chris White talks about sleep paralysis in there. Mark Flynn has given an interview. Doc Marquis, uh, Doctor Michael Lake, Mary Lake, I, just a ton of people. Um, there's a long, I think. 14 different uh, authors and researchers have, have given interviews to this thing. It's going to be a huge book, <laughs> uh, hmm. like, like seven, 800 pages book. It's it, but it's going to be worth it. Cause there's, it's going to be packed with information from all these different people. And I'm going to be including my own personal testimony in there and what I've learned about spiritual warfare uh, in there as well. So it, it's, it's going to be that, that that's coming soon. Ho hopefully I'm about, uh, about halfway halfway done with that. I have I have a uh, person transcribing it who's just excellent. Uh, she uh, transcribed an interview for me in Quantum Creation, and and uh, she's been helping me transcribe these these interviews for this book too. She does amazing work. So hey, if anybody needs a transcriber, get a hold of me. I got the perfect person for you. Um, so there, there's that, uh, and uh, there's a lot of other stuff that you know comes up and. <laughs> So if people want all the information, they can subscribe to my newsletter or just email me. That's fine, too. So, yeah, that's that. <laughs> that 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 sounds really exciting, Josh. That is awesome stuff, folks. www.ministudyministry.com. Thanks so much, Josh, for coming on the program today. And, folks, you have just heard Discovering the Truth with Dan Duvall. God bless and Godspeed. Discovering the Truth with Dan DeBall is the premier radio program designed to center you on the kingdom of God, to equip you with faith in Jesus Christ, and to unveil the truth behind the lies. This program has been a production of Bride Ministries. You can find us at www.bridemovement.com. At our website, you can contact us access resources, and support us with donations. We need partners in order to continue to produce our vision, which is to promote unity in the body of Christ worldwide and assist in the creation and development of sheep nations. Partner with us and be sure to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Until next time, God bless and Godspeed.